Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Rich Dad Month rolls on today as we talk about pummeling your tax obligation into a dizzying submission through taking the home office deduction, investing in real estate opportunity zones, and perhaps even tearing down your IRA with Rich Dad Tax Advisor Tom Wheelwright today on Get Rich Education. MC Lobsher is the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast and president of Producers Wealth. He is on a mission to help you achieve financial independence and freedom as soon as possible. He achieves this by integrating the infinite banking concept with real estate investments to increase your returns and recapture cash flow that you are not even aware of that you're losing. MC shares the number one strategy of investors in his holistic wealth creation course at yourownbankingsystem.com. Learn the easiest way to create wealth and passive income with real estate. Now you can access the best deals without the stress or hassle of having to find, renovate, or manage those investment properties. Narada Real Estate saves you time by providing you with passive income investment properties in some of the best U.S. markets. Learn more at PassiveRealEstateInvesting.com and download your free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Passive Real Estate Investing. There's no obligation and nothing to buy. Simply visit PassiveRealEstateInvesting.com. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE from Armenia to Antigua and across 188 nations worldwide. I'm Keith Weinhold, this is Get Rich Education, and this is week three out of four of Rich Dad Month, where we talk to a different Rich Dad influencer every week, all month. But first, we've had a good bit of real estate news since Rich Dad Month began here two weeks ago. Physical retailers have taken a bunch of hits in this first quarter of the year, as thousands of store closings have been announced all over the place, seemingly. And notice how a lot of these prominent closures are the types of stores that you see in malls and how this is further going to give malls a black eye and how the very look and feel of American malls is going to change. These closures are names you probably grew up with. Gap will close 230 Gap brand stores. That's about half of all of their locations. Half of the Gap's gone. And Gap is like an American shopping mall mainstay. That is just about as core as it gets for a non-anchor store. Gap also spun off Old Navy. Jimboree announced store closures. JCPenney is saying goodbye to 18 more locations across the U.S. Victoria's Secret will close more than 50 stores just this year. And you pair that news from a few weeks ago with Payless Shoe Sources bankruptcy and their 2,500 planned store closures. And things are looking really bleak for malls. And when there are that many widespread closures in such a short amount of time, well, that just makes you wonder what is going to be announced next as e-commerce continues to change the way that retailers think about brick and mortar locations. It's pretty apparent that there just are too many of them. Retail isn't dying. Physical retail is dying. Some physical shopping malls are going to have to adapt into stores that provide something more experiential for you to get you in there instead of places with aisles and shelves. And if they don't adapt, they will die. Tesla is moving all of its sales online and it will shutter almost all of its stores as a result. In fact, a Tesla company spokesperson said you can now buy a Tesla in North America with your phone in about one minute. Now, you'll remember that we recently had Gene Garino on the show, and we talked about how you can generate $10,000 of monthly cash flow by converting a single family home into an assisted living home. Well, since then, there was a most interesting and really humorous real estate story that was reported, and a man on the brink of retirement wants to spend his golden years chilling at the Holiday Inn instead of a retirement home. KTRK Television in Houston, Texas reports that Spring, Texas resident Terry Robeson, age 64, worked out a detailed comparison between the two options, an assisted living home or a Holiday Inn in his golden years. 
and living at the mid-priced hotel chain appeared to win out by a landslide over living in an assisted living home. Robeson determined that the average cost of nursing home care is about $188 per day. Compare that to a long-term stay with a senior discount at Holiday Inn, and that is $59.23 per day. Plus, it takes months to get into decent nursing homes, Robeson said. Instead, Holiday Inn will take your reservation today. The maintenance is virtually non-existent, Robeson figured. Television broken, light bulbs need changing, need a mattress replaced? No problem. They fix everything and they apologize for the inconvenience. Breakfast is included and some have happy hours in the afternoon. That gives me a leftover $129 a day for lunch and dinner in any restaurant we want or room service or laundry or gratuities and special TV movies, Robeson said. Plus, Holiday Inn provides a spa, a swimming pool, a workout room, a lounge, and a washer-dryer. Most have free toothpaste and razors, and all have free shampoo and soap. $5 worth of housekeeping tips a day, and you'll have the entire staff scrambling to help you. They treat you like a customer, not a patient. There's a city bus stop out front, and seniors ride for free. The handicap bus will also pick you up if you fake a decent limp <laughs> to meet other nice people. Call a church bus on Sundays. For a change of scenery, take the airport shuttle bus and eat at one of the nice restaurants out at the airport. While you're at the airport, fly somewhere. Otherwise, your cash is going to keep building up from all these savings in not staying in an assisted living home. And you're not stuck in one place forever either. You can move from Holiday Inn to Holiday Inn or even from city to city. Do you want to go see Hawaii? Well, they have a Holiday Inn there too. The Inn has a night security person and daily room service. The maid checks to see if you're okay. If not, they'll call an ambulance or the undertaker. If you fall and break a hip, Medicare will pay for the hip and Holiday Inn will upgrade you to a suite for the rest of your life. And no worries about visits from family. They will always be glad to find you and probably check in for a few days of mini vacation themselves. The grandkids can use the pool. What more can I ask for, Robeson said. So when I reach that golden age, I will face it with a grin thanks to not staying at an assisted living home and instead living my days out at the Holiday Inn. A representative for Intercontinental Hotels Group, which Holiday Inn is a subsidiary of, did not immediately respond to ABC News' request for comment. That is hilarious, and at the least, it is a thought-provoking alternative to an assisted living home for some people. Well, I am bringing you today's show from beautiful and pristine Anchorage, Alaska. There is still plenty of snow on the ground here. Next week, I'm still not sure, I'll either be hosting you from Anchorage or from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. In any case, I am leaving to go to Florida in about a week. You remember that I do quite a bit of business in both Alaska and Florida because in Florida, Tampa, Jacksonville, and Orlando are all good cash flowing real estate markets. And you would think that of all people, a geography degree holder like me would know better than to do business in both Alaska and Florida so much because they're not exactly proximus to each other. It definitely makes for some long flights. A lot of times there is just one layover in Seattle for me to go through, though. I don't think continental domestic trips get much longer than Anchorage to Florida. Hawaii to Maine is not a continental trip, so that gets disqualified. So speaking of the United States and that we have listeners in 188 world nations, yes, our chat with Rich Dan Tax Advisor Tom Wheelwright today is once again a decidedly American-centric theme here. As far as you in those other 187 nations go, as Tom talked about a few years ago here on the show, he studies the tax code when he travels the world, and he notices that many nations incentivize their taxpayers to behave similarly as the behaviors that the U.S. tax code incentivizes. But yes, at the least, the mechanics of exactly implementing these tax deductions are certainly going to vary internationally if they apply at all. Tom was just here two weeks ago telling us more about what it takes to qualify for the real estate professional designation. 
And something interesting that we didn't mention is that Tom himself cannot qualify for the real estate professional designation. That's something that he's stated publicly. It's not easy to obtain. I did not qualify as a real estate professional until about five years ago myself. Tom is back to tell you what you need to know to have near zero tax liability. And the reason that Tom is the most recurrent guest in Get Rich Education history is due to the fact that I am nowhere near the expert in issues of taxes and asset protection. These things are complicated, and I found that my best and highest use is outsourcing this to others. So when we talk about these issues on the show, I'm asking clarifying questions of Tom for myself just as much as I am for you. Bonus depreciation rules are pretty generous for you. They were formed in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. That's also known as the Trump tax law, and that's something that is not effective until 2018's taxes. One thing that the act created are geographically designated opportunity zones. The opportunity zones incentive is an investment tool, and it was established by Congress to encourage long-term investments in lower income urban and rural communities across the U.S. Now, why haven't I talked about opportunity zones very much on the show since they came out last year? Well, that's because to take advantage of the tax benefits in opportunity zones, For all intents and purposes, you have to be a developer. You can't just go buy a property in an opportunity zone. You have to double the basis of the improved portion of the property. Basically, you need to double the value of what you've paid for it. You need to do a knockdown and then build something new for the most part, or you've got to perform a complete rehab. You need to be an active investor and probably a developer. Opportunity zones are not for the passive investor. I'm going to learn more about Opportunity Zones with you. Are Opportunity Zones really that great of a deal? Why not just do a 1031 exchange to defer your capital gain, and that way you would have no restriction on where you buy? We'll talk to Tom about this and more straight ahead on Get Rich Education. Finally, Total Control Financial gives you checkbook control of your 401k and IRA money to invest in real estate. It's time to get your retirement money into your own checking account, but you've got to avoid the little-known tax that you'll pay with any self-directed IRA. Instead, it's time for the QRP. Learn more and get your free copy of the QRP book by text messaging QRP in all capital letters to 72000. For a real estate investor like you seeking an income property loan, go to Ridge Lending Group, NMLS 42056. Over the years, you've heard President Chaley Ridge generously devote her time to you here on the show as a guest. Ridge provides investment property loans in most U.S. states, and you're going to find out how they've helped more people realize their dreams of real estate financial freedom than any other mortgage lender in the entire nation when you get started at RidgeLendingGroup.com. This is our Rich Dad, Poor Dad author, Robert Kiyosaki. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. And the reason I respect Keith, he's a very strong, smart, bright young man. You probably already know who today's guest is because he's a regular contributor on taxes here at Get Rich Education. In fact, this is his GRE record 12th appearance here. He is the founder of WealthAbility. He's the author of the best-selling book, Tax-Free Wealth. He recently authored the book, More Important Than Money, along with Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad Advisors. Welcome back to Get Rich Education, Rich Dad Tax Advisor, Tom Lee Wright. Thanks, Keith. Always good to be on your show. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's so good to have you back. We have a lot of listeners that are incrementally building their real estate portfolio over time. And I often talk about the importance of outsourcing your management because what's your return on time invested with all this? But oftentimes you still have a little workspace that you might devote at home for managing your manager or managing your assets or perusing your property manager statements. It that often begs the question, well, now can I deduct a home office on my taxes? And unfortunately, at least the conventional wisdom out there is if I take the home office deduction, it increases the probability of an audit. So tell us about the home office deduction. So home office deduction is specifically allowed in the tax law. 
And the home office deduction is a much bigger deal than most accountants will let on. The reason accountants don't like it is A, because they're a little lazy, and B, because they are afraid of the IRS. If you do it right, I have not found the home office to increase your audit risk. What I mean by doing it right is if you're owning investment real estate, you should own that through probably a limited liability company that is owned in a partnership for tax purposes, which means that it has its own tax return. The reason that's important for the home office is if you're reporting your real estate investments on a partnership tax return, there is actually no place, there's no separate form for the home office. So the IRS doesn't even know you have it. It's just an office expense. It's lumped with all your other office expenses and it's just not a big deal. You do it right, it's not a red flag. If you do it wrong, meaning that you're a sole proprietor, that's the wrong way to do it anyway, then it's a little red flag. It's not like it used to be. It's much less of a red flag than it used to be. Unfortunately, we've got a lot of uh, long-term memory in the accounting profession. The other thing is, is that what people typically don't understand is what an impact it has on your automobile deduction by having a home office. Let's say you don't have a home office. The very first trip you take of the day, let's say you go see a property first trip. And then you go out and you see a bunch of properties. Then you come back and from your last property, you come home. Well, the first trip of the day to see that first property and the trip home from that last property, those are commutes and they're not deductible. On the other hand, if your first trip of the day is from your kitchen to your home office and your last trip of the day is from your home office to your (laughs) kitchen, then the IRS, by the way, in their instructions say that Now, that's your commute. So your commute, instead of being 30 miles each way, is 30 feet each way. It begins and ends in your home office. It does. So what that means is, is that for most people, that'll double as much as double the the deduction they get for the cars. A couple of weeks ago on the show, we talked about bonus depreciation. Bonus depreciation applies to cars. So, you know, the first year bonus depreciation on a passenger car is $10,000. If you've got 50% because you've got that commute and only 50% of your car expenses are deductible, you're only going to get a $5,000 deduction when you buy that car. But if you have a home office, you might get as much as $10,000. And it gets even better if you have a truck. Now, most people who are active in real estate, I know, own pickup trucks or SUVs because it's very important to be able to carry signs around and everything else around in your truck or your car. A full-size truck or SUV, that means it's over 6,000 pounds. You get bonus depreciation on 100% of the purchase price. So consider, you buy a $60,000 SUV or pickup truck. Let's say you drive it solely for work and you have a home office. And let's say you put zero down. So the bank has loaned you the entire $60,000. The year you buy that vehicle, you get a $60,000 deduction on your tax return. We're talking about bonus depreciation on cars and how that can effectively be an extension on home offices and the home office tax deduction you can get. And I'm a real estate professional and I do have the home office deduction. I even seem to remember taking a tape measure to the room dimensions and submitting them on my tax return, 200 square feet or whatever it was. And I think that trickled down into what percent of my home I do business in for the home office. And that had some difference with how great my deduction was. You know, you don't necessarily have to use a tape measure. You could just do number of rooms. So if your rooms are pretty comparable from room to room, the IRS says you can take the number of rooms. So if you have 10 rooms and you have one room for your home office, you get 10% of your house. We actually find that that measurement is usually easier plus better than actually measuring the square footage. It's not always, but most of the time it is. So I would recommend that. Now, I know what you, the listener, might be thinking out there right now. Yeah, I use the dining room to do business half the time, and we don't even eat dinner in the dining room very often, or even if we eat dinner in the dining room all the time, but I still do some of my business off the dining room table there. Could I qualify for the home deduction? No, it must be used exclusively. I'm going to give you an example. So I have a studio in my home, but the studio also has a Murphy bed for, you know, when our house gets filled up sometimes. I can't take that studio as a deduction because I use it for personal purposes. 
So you have to use it exclusively for business. But it, by the way, it doesn't have to be an entire room. It could be half of a room. You could take the back half of your dining room, and let's say you never eat in the back half of your dining room. Then take half of your dining room. Make that your home office. The tax law changes pretty frequently. It's actually one of the more dynamic areas of real estate investing. Some of the principles are more timeless, but taxes are ever-changing, and actually they're pretty complicated. One particular incentive that was introduced with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 is opportunity zones. And we haven't talked about opportunity zones on the show yet. And what they basically do is encourage long-term investments in generally lower income urban and rural areas nationwide. So they give investors an incentive to reinvest their unrealized capital gains into these designated opportunity zones in certain areas across America. Tell us some more about the upside and downside of opportunity zones, Tom. Tell us what the opportunity is. I'll tell you what the real upside is. You mentioned unrealized capital gains. You actually can invest your realized capital gains. So let me make a distinction here. If you do a 1031 exchange, that's an unrealized gain because you're exchanging and you're not recognizing the gain at all on your tax return. So it just is being deferred into the new property. But with a 1031 exchange, you have to invest the entire proceeds. Let's say that you sell a a property for a million dollars and the gain is $100,000. Well, you have to invest in a million dollar property, right? Under a 1031 exchange or more. Let's say that you don't want to invest in a million dollar property. Let's say you want to invest in a $200,000 property. Well, in opportunity zones, you can because you only have to roll over the gain. So you only have to roll over the $100,000. And not only that, you can roll over gains from the sale of stock, Bitcoin, your business. All of those can be rolled into an opportunity zone. Opportunity zones are unique that way. You don't have to have, it's not a like kind exchange. You don't have to do equal or up. You do have the same rules as far as to when you have to invest it. It has to be invested within 180 days after you sell whatever it is you sold to realize the capital gain or recognize the capital gain. Right. But you only have to reinvest the gain. So that's actually the biggest difference and the reason that somebody might want to look at Opportunity Zone. The other thing is these are up and coming areas. A lot of them, there's an Opportunity Zone in Scottsdale, Arizona. So there's an Opportunity Zone in Tempe, Arizona. I mean, these are not bad parts of town. They're just like industrial or they need to be redeveloped. So opportunity zones, you can also invest in a fund. So it doesn't have to be in a single property. It could be in a fund. It can be in a business. Now the rules are different for business. If it's in real estate, then you're good. If it's in business, there's some fairly detailed rules that you have to meet in order to be invested in that business. But you know, if you're looking at a place, where am I going to put my new office? I've got a business and part of my real estate investing is I want to own the real estate that my business resides in. I would absolutely be looking at an opportunity zone because after 10 years, this is when you're not rolling over again. You're just investing new in an opportunity zone. You hold that for 10 years. It's tax-free when you sell it. So it's completely tax-free. You don't have to defer the gain. You don't have to do a 1031. It's just tax-free. There are some real benefits in opportunity zones. And I just think they're a good thing to do. You're redeveloping a a tough part of town and you're going to get a higher cap rate. And, you know, as long as you're wise about your investing, I think they can be phenomenal potential. So that's the deal. If you have a capital gain and within the 180 day time limit, you invest that gain as a down payment or complete purchase into an opportunity zone. If you hold on to it for at least 10 years, the gain is tax free rather than tax deferred like it would be in a 1031 exchange. If you roll over the gain, the gain's just deferred. If you just invest new in an opportunity zone, you're not rolling over a gain and you invest new in an opportunity zone, then when you sell it, it's tax-free. So we have to distinguish. When you're rolling it over, that's tax-deferred, and it will actually be recognized as gain no later than December 31st of 2026. So that's just a deferral. If you're rolling over your gain, you're postponing it. But if you're investing brand new, in other words, you're not rolling over any gain, then that is tax-free after 10 years. You have to be building. So you can't go buy an existing building. 
if you buy an existing building, you actually have to put as much money into refurbishing the building as the building itself costs. It's an opportunity. It should be thought of as an opportunity development zone because you have to develop the property. I wonder if Opportunity Zones are really that great of a deal if a 1031 is already out there for the person that's relinquished property and they want to go ahead and reposition that gain, which is now equity, into another property. Because with 1031s, you could go ahead and pick anywhere to invest. For sure. If you're reinvesting the entire proceeds, 1031 makes sense. It's only when you're not reinvesting the entire proceeds or when it's not proceeds from real estate. It's proceeds from a business, it's proceeds from selling stock, it's proceeds from selling Bitcoin or gold, silver, some other kind of capital gain. I see. All right. So there are some similarities with that 180 day limit from the time that you relinquish property until the time that you need to go ahead and close on the replacement in either a 1031 tax deferred exchange or an opportunity zone. Correct. Is it the same 45 day identification period for each as well? No, it's just 180 days. Okay. So that's one less constraint with the opportunity zone, just the 180 days. Yeah. And you're right. There are constraints and you know, you want to make sure that this is what you want to do, but it's just that most people would not even consider that part of town. And now you might want to consider it. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I think every city in America seems to have an area known as the up and coming sure. area. And I've heard up and coming areas be referred to as up and coming areas for 30 years and they still really haven't come up, but who knows, maybe if enough people invest in opportunity zones, it really could turn around. I think you're going to see some turnarounds. I do Keith. There are some areas where you go, why is that an opportunity zone? Like Long Island, Scottsdale, right? But there are other areas like you go to Tampa, Florida, and there are some areas of Tampa you go, man, it would be really nice if somebody would come in and redevelop this area. We've even got an, an area in Tempe. You're going, it's really nice if somebody came in and redeveloped it. And they are. They're coming in to redevelop it. So I think you're going to see some real improvements to some of these areas that are not horrible areas. I mean, they're not like South Phoenix, for example. I mean, yeah, that's an opportunity zone, but I'm not sure I want to go there because You can't walk outside when it's dark and be safe. (laughs) But Tempe, where it's industrial and they want to redevelop it into something a little nicer, sure, why not? Well, Tom, you've turned around people's financial fortunes. They come to you for what their best and most actionable strategies are for reducing their taxes. You've done an awful lot of that for real estate investors. Is there any one particular thing that we haven't talked about today and that we also didn't talk about two weeks ago where people really see a dramatic change in their lives due to you making them aware of something that they didn't even know about in the tax code? Yes, there is. And I want to make sure we talk about it because this applies to a lot of real estate investors. A lot of real estate investors wonder, they've got money in their IRA. They'd like to invest in real estate. How do they do that? You know, historically, people have always been afraid of pulling it out of the IRA because they've got this, they could have up to a 40% tax rate plus a 10% penalty if they're under 60, basically under 59 and a half. Right. And so people have been convinced to leave it in their IRA, which I've never thought was a good idea. Under the, with these new bonus depreciation rules though, so I'm gonna give you a quick example. Follow my math. Let's say you have $100,000 in your IRA. If you were to pull it out and do nothing with it, then you would have a $40,000 tax and another $10,000 penalty. So you'd be left with $50,000. Now, by the way, you run the numbers, you're still better off taking it out if you're gonna invest in real estate, even after the first year because of your leverage. But let's say that now you don't worry about the taxes. You take the entire 100,000, you pull it out of your IRA, you go invest it in a $500,000 property. You get bank money of 80%, you go invest in a $500,000 property. Right. Bonus depreciation on that 500,000 is gonna be about $150,000. So now that $150,000 will offset the $100,000 of income from your IRA and the $50,000 that's left over could easily compensate for the penalty. So you could actually be, now this is assuming you can use it, real estate professional, all that stuff we talked about in the last show, but you could easily be better off tax-wise, day one, pulling it out of your IRA and investing in real estate than leaving it in your IRA. So that's something that I've not seen a lot of people consider, but 
I've run the numbers on many times. And if you're a real estate professional or your spouse is, or otherwise you can use that deduction, then pulling it out of the IRA may be the best thing tax wise you can do this year. I think a lot of people regret having an IRA once they learn about things like cash flow and leverage and arbitrage and really how to be an investor. And that technique right there, that's one of the advanced things that Tom understands and Tom's network of CPAs that he can refer you to know how to implement that sort of thing. Tom, how can someone learn more about you and connecting with you and your network of CPAs? Simply uh, come to our website, wealthability.com, wealthability.com. And there's a little button at the top that says schedule a call and we'll be happy to see how we might be able to help you, refer you to a CPA. Whatever we can do, we're just happy to help. Tom, between home offices, opportunity zones, and learning more about bonus depreciation, it's been insightful as always. Thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Thanks for having me, Keith. Well, yeah, more great learning from Tom Wheelwright today. Gosh, taxes are complicated. If you've ever regretted having an IRA, an individual retirement account, because you realize it doesn't produce cash flow and investments really should, but yet you did not want to tear down your traditional or Roth IRA due to the tax and the 10% penalty, well, what Tom just told us there at the end is pretty significant. Bonus depreciation could, with the emphasis on could, it could now make it worthwhile for you to pull money out of your IRA and invest in real estate or some type of cash flowing investment. It sounds like it could work if you're a real estate professional, but I would definitely consult a tax professional before making a decision on this. You should know specifically what you're doing here. Again, this is one area where I am not the expert, but if you're someone that has the type of day job that makes you wish that end of the world predictions would come true, well, that right there tilts toward you reevaluating the fact that your IRA is typically not going to help you out there for a few decades. It is a life deferral plan. People that have a mentality of trading time for dollars have a certain way of looking at their entire life. People who realize that the mission in life is to build things that pay you to own them have a different way of looking at their entire life. And every week, we bring you the knowledge, ideas, and resources that you need to build those things. I'm Keith Weinhold. I'm truly grateful for your listenership. But as always, you weren't here for me. You were here for you. There's actually a super convenient way to get each weekly Get Rich Education episode delivered to your podcatcher, and it never comes with any junk mail, just the episode. That is by touching the subscribe option on your podcatching device. You're probably a subscriber already. If not, I'd like to invite you to join in. Rich Dad, Poor Dad author Robert Kiyosaki returns to the show with me next week. Until then, don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. Countless investors get killed on their long-term maintenance costs in the rental property portfolio but that's far less likely when you buy brand new construction. Let me tell you about my friends at JWB Real Estate Capital in Jacksonville, Florida. They pioneered the build-to-rent model that allows clients like you to invest in new construction, turnkey rental property. That's why JWB has been featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and other national media. If you want new construction rental properties in your portfolio, talk to JWB. Give them a call at 904-677-6777 or visit them at newconstructionturnkey.com. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, getrichseducation.com.